Gallagher, A Newspaper Story by Richard Harding Davis Part 1 We had had so many office boys before Gallagher came among us that they had begun to lose the characteristics of individuals and became merged in a composite photograph of small boys to whom we applied the generic title of Here You! or You Boy! We had had sleepy boys and lazy boys and bright, smart boys who became so familiar on so short an acquaintance that we were forced to part with them to save our own self-respect. They generally graduated into district messenger boys and occasionally returned to us in blue coats with nickel-plated buttons and patronized us. But Gallagher was something different from anything we had experienced before. Gallagher was short and broad in build, with a solid, muscular broadness, and not a fat and dumpy shortness. He wore perpetually on his face a happy and knowing smile, as if you and the world in general were not impressing him as seriously as you thought you were. And his eyes, which were very black and very bright, snapped intelligently at you, like those of a little black and tan terrier. All Gallagher knew had been learnt on the streets, not a very good school in itself, but one that turns out very knowing scholars. And Gallagher had attended both morning and evening sessions. He could not tell you who the Pilgrim Fathers were, nor could he name the thirteen original states, but he knew all the officers of the 22nd Police District by name, and he could distinguish the clang of a fire engine's gong from that of a patrol wagon or an ambulance fully two blocks distant. It was Gallagher who rang the alarm when the Woolwich Mills caught fire, while the officer on the beat was asleep, and it was Gallagher who led the black diamonds against the wharf rats when they used to stone each other to their heart's content on the coal wharves of Richmond. I am afraid, now that I see these facts written down, that Gallagher was not a reputable character, but he was so very young and so very old for his years that we all liked him very much nevertheless. He lived in the extreme northern part of Philadelphia, where the cotton and woolen mills run down to the river, and how he ever got home after leaving the press building at two in the morning was one of the mysteries of the office. Sometimes he caught a night car, and sometimes he walked all the way, arriving at the little house where his mother and himself lived alone at four in the morning. Occasionally he was given a ride on an early milk cart or on one of the newspaper delivery wagons, with its high piles of papers still damp and sticky from the press. He knew several drivers of night hawks, those cabs that prowl the streets at night looking for belated passengers, and when it was a very cold morning he would not go home at all, but would crawl into one of these cabs and sleep, curled up on the cushions, until daylight. Besides being quick and cheerful, Gallagher possessed a power of amusing the press's young men to a degree seldom attained by the ordinary mortal. His clog dancing on the city editor's desk when that gentleman was upstairs fighting for two more columns of space was always a source of innocent joy to us, and his imitations of the comedians of the variety halls delighted even the dramatic critic, from whom the comedians themselves failed to force a smile. But Gallagher's chief characteristic was his love for that element of news generically classed as crime. Not that he ever did anything criminal himself. On the contrary, his was rather the work of the criminal specialist, and his morbid interest in the doings of all queer characters, his knowledge of their methods, their present whereabouts, and their past deeds of transgression, often rendered him a valuable ally to our police reporter, whose daily feuilletons were the only portion of the paper Gallagher deigned to read. In Gallagher, the detective element was abnormally developed. He had shown this on several occasions, and to excellent purpose. Once the paper had sent him into a home for destitute orphans, which was believed to be grievously mismanaged, 
and Gallagher, while playing the part of a destitute orphan, kept his eyes open to what was going on around him so faithfully that the story he told of the treatment meted out to the real orphans was sufficient to rescue the unhappy little wretches from the individual who had them in charge and to have the individual himself sent to jail. Gallagher's knowledge of the alias's terms of imprisonment and various misdoings of the leading criminals in Philadelphia was almost as thorough as that of the chief of police himself, and he could tell to an hour when Dutchy Mac was to be let out of prison and could identify at a glance Dick Oxford Confidence Man as Gentleman Dan Petty Thief. There were at this time only two pieces of news in any of the papers. The least important of the two was the big fight between the champion of the United States and the would-be champion arranged to take place near Philadelphia. The second was the Burbank murder, which was filling space in newspapers all over the world, from New York to Bombay. Richard F. Burbank was one of the most prominent of New York's railroad lawyers, he was also, as a matter of course, an owner of much railroad stock, and a very wealthy man. He had been spoken of as a political possibility for many high offices, and, as the counsel for a great railroad, was known even further than the great railroad itself had stretched its system. At six o'clock one morning he was found by his butler lying at the foot of the hall stairs, with two pistol wounds above his heart. He was quite dead. His safe, to which only he and his secretary had the keys, was found open, and two hundred thousand dollars in bonds, stocks, and money, which had been placed there only the night before, was found missing. The secretary was missing also. His name was Stephen S. Hayde, and his name and his description had been telegraphed and cabled to all parts of the world. There was enough circumstantial evidence to show, beyond any question or possibility of mistake, that he was the murderer. It made an enormous amount of talk, and unhappy individuals were being arrested all over the country, and sent on to New York for identification. Three had been arrested at Liverpool, and one man just as he landed at Sydney, Australia. But so far the murderer had escaped. We were all talking about it one night, as everybody else was all over the country, in the local room, and the city editor said it was worth a fortune to anyone who chanced to run across Hayde and succeeded in handing him over to the police. Some of us thought Hayde had taken passage from some one of the smaller seaports, and others were of the opinion that he had buried himself in some cheap lodging house in New York or in one of the smaller towns in New Jersey. "'I shouldn't be surprised to meet him out walking, right here in Philadelphia,' said one of the staff. "'He'll be disguised, of course, but you could always tell him by the absence of the trigger finger on his right hand. It's missing, you know. Shot off when he was a boy.' "'You want to look for a man dressed like a tough,' said the city editor." for as this fellow is to all appearances a gentleman, he will try to look as little like a gentleman as possible. No, he won't, said Gallagher, with that calm impertinence that made him dear to us. He'll dress just like a gentleman. Tufts don't wear gloves, and you see he's got to wear em. The first thing he thought of after doing for Burbank was of that gone finger and how he was to hide it. He stuffed the finger of that glove with cotton so as to make it look like a whole finger. And the first time he takes off that glove, they've got him. See? And he knows it. So what yous want to do is to look for a man with gloves on. I've been a-doing it for two weeks now, and I can tell you it's hard work, for everybody wears gloves this kind of weather. But if you look long enough, you'll find him. And when you think it's him... Go up to him and hold out your hand in a friendly way, like a bunco steerer, and shake his hand. And if you feel that his forefinger ain't real flesh, but just wadded cotton, then grip to it with your right and grab his throat with your left, and holler for help. There was an appreciative pause. 
"'I see, gentlemen,' said the city editor dryly, "'that Gallagher's reasoning has impressed you, "'and I also see that before the week is out "'all of my young men will be under bonds "'for assaulting innocent pedestrians "'whose only offence is that they wear gloves in midwinter.' It was about a week after this that Detective Heffelfinger, of Inspector Burns' staff, came over to Philadelphia after a burglar, of whose whereabouts he had been misinformed by telegraph. He brought the warrant, requisition, and other necessary papers with him, but the burglar had flown. One of our reporters had worked on a New York paper, and knew Heffelfinger, and the detective came to the office to see if he could help him in his so far unsuccessful search he gave gallagher his card and after gallagher had read it and had discovered who the visitor was he became so demoralized that he was absolutely useless one of burns men was a much more awe-inspiring individual to gallagher than a member of the cabinet he accordingly seized his hat and overcoat and leaving his duties to be looked after by others hastened out after the object of his admiration who found his suggestions and knowledge of the city so valuable and his company so entertaining that they became very intimate and spent the rest of the day together in the meanwhile, the managing editor had instructed his subordinates to inform Gallagher, when he condescended to return, that his services were no longer needed. Gallagher had played truant once too often. Unconscious of this, he remained with his new friend until late the same evening, and started the next afternoon toward the press office. As I have said, Gallagher lived in the most distant part of the city, not many minutes' walk from the Kensington Railroad Station, where trains ran into the suburbs and on to New York. It was in front of this station that a smoothly shaven, well-dressed man brushed past Gallagher and hurried up the steps to the ticket office. He held a walking stick in his right hand, and Gallagher, who now patiently scrutinized the hands of every one who wore gloves, saw that while three fingers of the man's hand were closed around the cane, the fourth stood out in almost a straight line with his palm. Gallagher stopped with a gasp, and with a trembling all over his little body, and his brain asked with a throb if it could be possible but possibilities and probabilities were to be discovered later now was the time for action he was after the man in a moment hanging at his heels and his eyes moist with excitement he heard the man ask for a ticket to tarsdale a little station just outside of philadelphia and when he was out of hearing but not out of sight purchased one for the same place the stranger went into the smoking-car and seated himself at one end toward the door. Gallagher took his place at the opposite end. He was trembling all over and suffered from a slight feeling of nausea. He guessed it came from fright, not of any bodily harm that might come to him, but at the probability of failure in his adventure and of its most momentous possibilities. The stranger pulled his coat collar up around his ears, hiding the lower portion of his face, but not concealing the resemblance in his troubled eyes and close-shut lips to the likenesses of the murderer Hade. They reached Torsdale in half an hour, and the stranger, alighting quickly, struck off at a rapid pace down the country road leading to the station. Gallagher gave him a hundred yards start, and then followed slowly after— the road ran between fields and passed a few frame-houses set far from the road in kitchen gardens. Once or twice the man looked back over his shoulder, but he saw only a dreary length of road, with a small boy splashing through the slush in the midst of it, and stopping every now and again to throw snowballs at belated sparrows. After a ten minutes' walk, the stranger turned into a side road which led to only one place, the Eagle Inn an old roadside hostelry known now as the headquarters for pot-hunters from the Philadelphia game market, and the battleground of many a cockfight. Gallagher knew the place well. He and his young companions had often stopped there when out chestnutting on holidays in the autumn. 
The son of the man who kept it had often accompanied them on their excursions, and though the boys of the city streets considered him a dumb lout, they respected him somewhat owing to his inside knowledge of dog and cockfights. The stranger entered the inn at a side door, and Gallagher, reaching it a few minutes later, let him go for the time being, and set about finding his occasional playmate, young Kepler. Kepler's offspring was found in the woodshed. "'Tain't hard to guess what brings you out here,' said the tavern-keeper's son with a grin. "'It's the fight!' "'What fight?' asked Gallagher unguardedly. "'What fight? Why, the fight!' returned his companion, with a slow contempt of superior knowledge. "'It's to come off here to-night. You knew that as well as me. Anyway, your sportin' editor knows it. He got the tip last night. But that won't help you any. You needn't think there's any chance of your getting a peep at it. Why, tickets is two hundred and fifty apiece.' <whistles> "'Whistled Gallagher. Where's it to be?' "'In the barn,' whispered Kepler. "'I helped them fix the ropes this morning, I did.' "'Gosh, but you're in luck!' exclaimed Gallagher, with flattering envy. "'Couldn't I just get a peep at it?' "'Maybe,' said the gratified Kepler. "'There's a winder with a wooden shutter at the back of the barn. "'You can get in by it, if you have someone to boost you up to the sill.' "'Say!' drawled Gallagher, as if something had but just that moment reminded him. "'Who's that gent who come down the road just a bit ahead of me? Him with the cape coat. Has he got anything to do with the fight?' "'Him,' repeated Kepler in tones of sincere disgust. "'No, oh, he ain't no sport. He's queer, Dad thinks. He come here one day last week about ten in the morning, said his doctor told him to go out in the country for his health. He's stuck up and citified, and wears gloves, and takes his meals private in his room, and all that sort of ruck. They were saying in the saloon last night that they thought that he was hiding from something, and Dad, just to try him, asks him last night if he was coming to see the fight. He looked kind of scared and said he didn't want to see no fight. And then Dad says, I guess you mean you don't want no fighters to see you. Dad didn't mean no harm by it, just passed it as a joke. But Mr. Carlton, as he calls himself, got white as a ghost and says, I'll go to the fight willing enough, and begins to laugh and joke. And this morning he went right into the bar room where all the sports were settin', and said he was going into town to see some friends. And as he starts off he laughs and says, This don't look as if I was afraid of seeing people, does it? But Dad says it was just bluff that made him do it, and Dad thinks that if he hadn't said what he did, this Mr. Carlton wouldn't have left his room at all. Gallagher had got all he wanted, and much more than he had hoped for, so much more that his walk back to the station was in the nature of a triumphal march. He had twenty minutes to wait for the next train, and it seemed an hour. While waiting, he sent a telegram to Heffelfinger at his hotel. It read, "'Your man is near the Torresdale Station, on Pennsylvania Railroad. Take cab and meet me at station. Wait until I come. Gallagher.' With the exception of one at midnight, no other train stopped at Torresdale that evening, hence the direction to take a cab. The train to the city seemed to Gallagher to drag itself by inches, it stopped and backed at purposeless intervals waited for an express to precede it and dallied at stations and when at last it reached the terminus gallagher was out before it had stopped and was in the cab and off on his way to the home of the sporting editor the sporting editor was at dinner and came out in the hall to see him with his napkin in his hand Gallagher explained breathlessly that he had located the murderer for whom the police of two continents were looking, and that he believed, in order to quiet the suspicions of the people with whom he was hiding, that he would be present at the fight that night. The sporting editor led Gallagher into his library and shut the door. Now, he said, go over all that again. Gallagher went over it again in detail, and added how he had sent for Heffelfinger to make the arrest in order that it might be kept from the knowledge of the local police and from the Philadelphia reporters. 
What I want Heffelfinger to do is to arrest Hade with the warrant he has for the burglar, explained Gallagher, and to take him on to New York on the owl train that passes Torresdale at one. It don't get to Jersey City until four o'clock, one hour after the morning papers go to press. Of course, we must fix Heffelfinger so's he'll keep quiet and not tell who his prisoner really is. The sporting editor reached his hand out to pat Gallagher on the head, but changed his mind and shook hands with him instead. "'My boy,' he said, "'you are an infant phenomenon. If I can pull the rest of this thing off tonight, it will mean the five thousand dollar reward and fame galore for you and the paper. Now I'm going to write a note to the managing editor, and you could take it around to him, and tell him what you've done and what I am going to do.' and he'll take you back on the paper and raise your salary. Perhaps you didn't know you've been discharged? Do you think you ain't a-goin' to take me with you? demanded Gallagher. Why, certainly not. Why should I? It all lies with the detective and myself now. You've done your share and done it well. If the man's caught, the reward's yours. But you'd only be in the way now. You'd better go to the office and make your peace with the chief. "'If the paper can get along without me, I can get along without the old paper,' said Gallagher hotly. "'And if I ain't a-goin' with you, you ain't neither, for I know where Heffelfinger is to be, and you don't, and I won't tell you.' "'Oh, very well, very well,' replied the sporting editor, weakly capitulating. "'I'll send the note by a messenger. Only mind, if you lose your place, don't blame me.' Gallagher wondered how this man could value a week's salary against the excitement of seeing a noted criminal run down, and of getting the news to the paper, and to that one paper alone. From that moment the sporting editor sank in Gallagher's estimation. Mr. Dwyer sat down at his desk and scribbled off the following note. I have received reliable information that Hade, the Burbank murderer, will be present at the fight tonight. We have arranged it so that he will be arrested quietly, and in such a manner that the fact may be kept from all other papers. I need not point out to you that this will be the most important piece of news in the country tomorrow. Yours, etc., Michael E. Dwyer. The sporting editor stepped into the waiting cab, while Gallagher whispered the directions to the driver. He was told to go first to a district messenger's office, and from there up to the Ridge Avenue Road, out Broad Street, and on to the Old Eagle Inn near Torresdale. It was a miserable night. The rain and snow were falling together, and freezing as they fell. The sporting editor got out to send his message to the press office, and then, lighting a cigar and turning up the collar of his great coat, curled up in the corner of the cab. "'Wake me when we get there, Gallagher,' he said. He knew he had a long ride and much rapid work before him, and he was preparing for the strain. To Gallagher the idea of going to sleep seemed almost criminal. From the dark corner of the cab his eyes shone with excitement and with the awful joy of anticipation. He glanced every now and then to where the sporting editor's cigar shone in the darkness, and watched it as it gradually burnt more dimly and went out. The lights in the shop windows threw a broad glare across the ice on the pavements, and the lights from the lamp posts tossed the distorted shadow of the cab and the horse and the motionless driver, sometimes before and sometimes behind them. After half an hour Gallagher slipped down to the bottom of the cab and dragged out a lap-robe in which he wrapped himself. It was growing colder, and the damp, keen wind swept in through the cracks until the window frames and woodwork were cold to the touch. Part Two An hour passed, and the cab was still moving more slowly over the rough surface of partly paved streets and by single rows of new houses standing at different angles to each other, in fields covered with ash heaps and brick kilns. Here and there the gaudy lights of a drug store and the forerunner of suburban civilization shone from the end of a new block of houses, and the rubber cape of an occasional policeman showed in the light of the lamp-post that he hugged for comfort. 
then even the houses disappeared and the cab dragged its way between truck farms with desolate-looking glass-covered beds and pools of water half caked with ice and bare trees and interminable fences once or twice the cab stopped altogether, and Gallagher could hear the driver swearing to himself, or at the horse, or the roads. At last they drew up before the station at Torresdale. It was quite deserted, and only a single light cut a swathe in the darkness, and showed a portion of the platform, the ties and the rails glistening in the rain. They walked twice past the light before a figure stepped out of the shadow, and greeted them cautiously. "'I am Mr. Dwyer of the press,' said the sporting editor briskly. "'You've heard of me, perhaps. Well, there shouldn't be any difficulty in our making a deal, should there? This boy here has found Haid, and we have reason to believe he will be among the spectators at the fight to-night. We want you to arrest him quietly, and as secretly as possible. You can do it with your papers and your badge easily enough.' We want you to pretend that you believe he is this burglar you came over after. If you will do this and take him away without anyone so much as suspecting who he really is, and on the train that passes here at 120 for New York, we will give you $500 out of the $5,000 reward. If, however, one other paper, either in New York or Philadelphia or anywhere else, knows of the arrest, you won't get a cent. Now what do you say? The detective had a great deal to say. He wasn't at all sure the man Gallagher suspected was Haid. He feared he might get himself into trouble by making a false arrest, and if it should be the man, he was afraid the local police would interfere. "'We've no time to argue or debate this matter,' said Dwyer warmly. "'We agree to point Haid out to you in the crowd. After the fight is over, you arrest him as we have directed, and you get the money and the credit of the arrest.' If you don't like this, I will arrest the man myself and have him driven to town with a pistol for a warrant. Heffelfinger considered in silence, and then agreed unconditionally. As you say, Mr. Dwyer, he returned, I've heard of you for a thoroughbred sport. I know you'll do what you say you'll do, and as for me, I'll do what you say and just as you say, and it's a very pretty piece of work as it stands. They all stepped back into the cab, and then it was that they were met by a fresh difficulty. How to get the detective into the barn where the fight was to take place, for neither of the two men had two hundred and fifty dollars to pay for his admittance. But this was overcome when Gallagher remembered the window of which young Kepler had told him. In the event of Hade's losing courage and not daring to show himself in the crowd around the ring, it was agreed that Dwyer should come to the barn and warn Heffelfinger. But if he should come, Dwyer was merely to keep near him and to signify by a prearranged gesture which one of the crowd he was. They drew up before a great black shadow of a house, dark, forbidding, and apparently deserted but at the sound of the wheels on the gravel the door opened, letting out a stream of warm, cheerful light, and a man's voice said, "'Put out those lights. Don't you know no better than that?' This was Kepler, and he welcomed Mr. Dwyer with effusive courtesy. The two men showed in the stream of light, and the door closed on them, leaving the house as it was at first, black and silent, save for the dripping of the rain and snow from the eaves. The detective and Gallagher put out the cab's lamps and led the horse toward a long, low shed in the rear of the yard, which they now noticed was almost filled with teams of many different makes, from the Hobson's choice of a livery stable to the brougham of the man about town. No, said Gallagher, as the cabman stopped to hitch the horse beside the others, we want it nearest that lower gate. When we newspaper men leave this place, we'll leave it in a hurry, and the man who is nearest town is likely to get there first. You won't be a following of no hearse when you make your return trip. Gallagher tied the horse to the very gatepost itself, leaving the gate open and allowing a clear road and a flying start for the prospective race to Newspaper Row. 
The driver disappeared under the shelter of the porch, and Gallagher and the detective moved off cautiously to the rear of the barn. "'This must be the window,' said Heffelfinger, pointing to a broad wooden shutter some feet from the ground. "'Just you give me a boost once, and I'll get that open in a jiffy,' said Gallagher. The detective placed his hands on his knees, and Gallagher stood upon his shoulders, and with the blade of his knife lifted the wooden button that fastened the window on the inside, and pulled the shutter open. Then he put one leg inside over the sill, and leaning down helped to draw his fellow conspirator up to a level with the window. "'I feel just like I was burglarizing a house,' chuckled Gallagher." as he dropped noiselessly to the floor below and refastened the shutter. The barn was a large one, with a row of stalls on either side, in which horses and cows were dozing. There was a haymow over each row of stalls, and at one end of the barn a number of fence-rails had been thrown across from one mow to the other. These rails were covered with hay. In the middle of the floor was the ring— it was not really a ring, but a square, with wooden posts at its four corners through which ran a heavy rope. The space enclosed by the rope was covered with sawdust. Gallagher could not resist stepping into the ring, and after stamping the sawdust once or twice, as if to assure himself that he was really there, began dancing around it, and indulging in such a remarkable series of fistic maneuvers with an imaginary adversary that the unimaginative detective precipitately backed into a corner of the barn. "'Now, then,' said Gallagher, having apparently vanquished his foe, "'you come with me.' His companion followed quickly as Gallagher climbed to one of the haymows, and, crawling carefully out on the fence-rail, stretched himself at full length, face downward. In this position, by moving the straw a little, he could look down, without being himself seen, upon the heads of whomsoever stood below. "'This is better'n a private box, ain't it?' said Gallagher. The boy from the newspaper office and the detective lay there in silence, biting at straws and tossing anxiously on their comfortable bed. It seemed fully two hours before they came. Gallagher had listened without breathing, and with every muscle on a strain, at least a dozen times, when some movement in the yard had led him to believe that they were at the door. And he had numerous doubts and fears. Sometimes it was that the police had learnt of the fight and had raided Kepler's in his absence, and again it was that the fight had been postponed, or, worst of all, that it would be put off until so late that Mr. Dwyer could not get back in time for the last edition of the paper. Their coming, when at last they came, was heralded by an advance guard of two sporting men, who stationed themselves at either side of the big door. "'Hurry up now, gents,' one of the men said with a shiver. "'Don't keep this door open no longer than is needful.' It was not a very large crowd, but it was wonderfully well selected. It ran, in the majority of its component parts, to heavy white coats with pearl buttons. The white coats were shouldered by long blue coats with astrakhan fur trimmings, the wearers of which preserved a clickness not remarkable when one considers that they believed everyone else present to be either a crook or a prize fighter. There were well fed, well groomed clubmen and brokers in the crowd, a politician or two, a popular comedian with his manager amateur boxers from the athletic clubs, and quiet, close-mouthed sporting men from every city in the country. Their names, if printed in the papers, would have been as familiar as the types of the papers themselves. And among these men, whose only thought was of the brutal sport to come, was Hade, with Dwyer standing at ease at his shoulder, Hade, white and visibly in deep anxiety, hiding his pale face beneath a cloth travelling cap, and with his chin muffled in a woollen scarf. He had dared to come because he feared his danger from the already suspicious Kepler was less than if he stayed away. And so he was there, hovering restlessly on the border of the crowd, feeling his danger and sick with fear. 
When Heffelfinger first saw him, he started up on his hands and elbows, and made a movement forward, as if he would leap down then and there, and carry off his prisoner single-handed. "'Lie down!' growled Gallagher. "'An officer of any sort wouldn't live three minutes in that crowd.' The detective drew back slowly, and buried himself again in the straw, but never once through the long fight which followed did his eyes leave the person of the murderer. The newspaper men took their places in the foremost row, close around the ring, and kept looking at their watches and begging the master of ceremonies to shake it up, do. There was a great deal of betting, and all of the men handled the great roll of bills they wagered with a flippant recklessness which could only be accounted for in Gallagher's mind by temporary mental derangement. Someone pulled a box out into the ring, and the master of ceremonies mounted it, and pointed out in forcible language that as they were almost all already under bonds to keep the peace, it behooved all to curb their excitement and to maintain a severe silence unless they wanted to bring the police upon them and have themselves sent down for a year or two. Then two very disreputable-looking persons toss their respective principals' high hats into the ring, and the crowd, recognizing in this relic of the days when brave knights threw down their gauntlets in the lists as only a sign that the fight was about to begin, cheered tumultuously. This was followed by a sudden surging forward, and a mutter of admiration much more flattering than the cheers had been, when the principals followed their hats, and slipping out of their greatcoats, stood forth in all the physical beauty of the perfect brute. Their pink skin was as soft and healthy-looking as a baby's, and glowed in the lights of the lanterns like tinted ivory, and underneath the silken covering the great biceps and muscles moved in and out, and looked like the coils of a snake around the branch of a tree. Gentlemen and blackguards shouldered each other for a nearer view. The coachmen, whose metal buttons were unpleasantly suggestive of police, put their hands, in the excitement of the moment, on the shoulders of their masters. The perspiration stood out in great drops on the foreheads of the backers, and the newspaper men bit somewhat nervously at the ends of their pencils and in the stalls the cows munched contentedly at their cuds, and gazed with gentle curiosity at their two fellow brutes, who stood waiting the signal to fall upon, and kill each other if need be, for the delectation of their brothers. "'Take your places,' commanded the master of ceremonies. In the moment in which the two men faced each other, the crowd became so still that, save for the beating of the rain upon the shingled roof and the stamping of a horse in one of the stalls, the place was as silent as a church. "'Time!' shouted the master of ceremonies. The two men sprang into a posture of defense, which was lost as quickly as it was taken. One great arm shot out like a piston-rod. There was the sound of bare fists beating on naked flesh. There was an exultant, indrawn gasp of savage pleasure and relief from the crowd, and the great fight had begun. How the fortunes of war rose and fell, and changed and rechanged that night, is an old story to those who listen to such stories, and those who do not will be glad to be spared the telling of it. It was, they say, one of the bitterest fights between two men that this country has ever known. But all that is of interest here is that, after an hour of this desperate, brutal business, the champion ceased to be the favorite. The man whom he had taunted and bullied, and for whom the public had but little sympathy, was proving himself a likely winner and under his cruel blows as sharp and clean as those from a cutlass his opponent was rapidly giving way the men about the ropes were past all control now they drowned kepler's petitions for silence with oaths and in inarticulate shouts of anger as if the blows had fallen upon them and in mad rejoicings 
They swept from one end of the ring to the other, with every muscle leaping in unison with those of the man they favored, and when a New York correspondent muttered over his shoulder that this would be the biggest sporting surprise since the Heenan Sayers fight, Mr. Dwyer nodded his head sympathetically in assent. In the excitement and tumult, it is doubtful if any heard the three quickly repeated blows that fell heavily from the outside upon the big doors of the barn. If they did, it was already too late to mend matters, for the door fell, torn from its hinges, and as it fell a captain of police sprang into the light from out of the storm, with his lieutenants and their men crowding close at his shoulder. In the panic and stampede that followed, several of the men stood as helplessly immovable as though they had seen a ghost. Others made a mad rush into the arms of the officers, and were beaten back against the ropes of the ring. Others dived headlong into the stalls among the horses and cattle, and still others shoved the rolls of money they held into the hands of the police, and begged like children to be allowed to escape. The instant the door fell and the raid was declared, Heffelfinger slipped over the cross rails on which he had been lying, hung for an instant by his hands, and then dropped into the center of the fighting mob on the floor. He was out of it in an instant with the agility of a pickpocket, was across the room and at Hade's throat like a dog. The murderer, for the moment, was the calmer man of the two, here he panted hands off now there's no need for all this violence there's no great harm in looking at a fight is there there's a hundred dollar bill in my right hand take it and let me slip out of this no one is looking here but the detective only held him the closer i want you for burglary he whispered under his breath you've got to come with me now and quick the less fuss you make the better for both of us if you don't know who I am, you can feel my badge under my coat there. I've got the authority. It's all regular. And when we're out of this damned row, I'll show you the papers. He took one hand from Hade's throat and pulled a pair of handcuffs from his pocket. It's a mistake. This is an outrage, gasped the murderer, white and trembling, but dreadfully alive and desperate for his liberty. Let me go, I tell you. Take your hands off of me. Do I look like a burglar, you fool? I know who you look like, whispered the detective, with his face close to the face of his prisoner. Now, will you go easy as a burglar, or shall I tell these men who you are and what I do want you for? Shall I call out your real name or not? Shall I tell them? Quick, speak up. Shall I? There was something so exultant, something so unnecessarily savage in the officer's face, that the man he held saw that the detective knew him for what he really was, and the hands that had held his throat slipped down around his shoulders, or he would have fallen. The man's eyes opened and closed again, and he swayed weakly backward and forward, and choked as if his throat were dry and burning. Even to such a hardened connoisseur in crime as Gallagher, who stood closely by, drinking it in, there was something so abject in the man's terror that he regarded him with what was almost a touch of pity. "'For God's sake!' Hade begged. "'Let me go. Come with me to my room, and I'll give you half the money. I'll divide with you fairly. We can both get away. There's a fortune for both of us there. We both can get away.' You'll be rich for life. Do you understand? For life. But the detective, to his credit, only shut his lips the tighter. That's enough, he whispered in return. That's more than I expected. You've sentenced yourself already. Come. Two officers in uniform barred their exit at the door, but Heffelfinger smiled easily and showed his badge. One of Burns's men, he said in explanation, came over expressly to take this chap, He's a burglar, Arlie Lane, alias Carlton. I've shown the papers to the captain. It's all regular. I'm just going to get his traps at the hotel and walk him over to the station. I guess we'll push right on to New York tonight. The officers nodded and smiled their admiration for the representative of what is perhaps the best detective force in the world, and let him pass. Then Heffelfinger turned and spoke to Gallagher, who still stood as watchful as a dog at his side. 
"'I'm going to the room to get his bonds and stuff,' he whispered. "'Then I'll march him to the station and take that train. "'I've done my share. Don't forget yours.' "'Oh, you'll get your money right enough,' said Gallagher. "'And say,' he added, with the appreciative nod of an expert, "'do you know you did it rather well?' Mr. Dwyer had been writing while the raid was settling down, as he had been writing while waiting for the fight to begin. Now he walked over to where the other correspondents stood in angry conclave. The newspaper men had informed the officers who hemmed them in that they represented the principal papers of the country, and were expostulating vigorously with the captain, who had planned the raid, and who declared they were under arrest. "'Don't be an ass, Scott!' said Mr. Dwyer, who was too excited to be polite or politic. "'You know our being here isn't a matter of choice. We came here on business, as you did, and you've no right to hold us.' "'If we don't get our stuff on the wire at once,' protested a New York man, "'we'll be too late for tomorrow's paper, and—' Captain Scott said he did not care a profanely small amount for tomorrow's paper, and that all he knew was that to the station-house the newspaper men would go.' There they would have a hearing, and if the magistrate chose to let them off, that was the magistrate's business, but that his duty was to take them into custody. "'But then it will be too late, don't you understand?' shouted Mr. Dwyer. "'You've got to let us go now, at once.' "'I can't do it, Mr. Dwyer,' said the captain, "'and that's all there is to it. Why, haven't I just sent the president of the Junior Republican Club to the patrol wagon?' the man that put this coat on me and do you think i can let you fellows go after that you were all put under bonds to keep the peace not three days ago and here you're at it fighting like badgers it's worth my place to let one of you off what mr dwyer said next was so uncomplimentary to the gallant captain scott that that overwrought individual seized the sporting editor by the shoulder and shoved him into the hands of two of his men this was more than the distinguished Mr. Dwyer could brook, and he excitedly raised his hand in resistance. But before he had time to do anything foolish, his wrist was gripped by one strong little hand, and he was conscious that another was picking the pocket of his great coat. He slapped his hands to his sides, and looking down saw Gallagher standing close behind him and holding him by the wrist. Mr. Dwyer had forgotten the boy's existence, and would have spoken sharply if something in Gallagher's innocent eyes had not stopped him. Gallagher's hand was still in that pocket in which Mr. Dwyer had shoved his notebook filled with what he had written of Gallagher's work and Hade's final capture, and with a running descriptive account of the fight. With his eyes fixed on Mr. Dwyer, Gallagher drew it out, and with a quick movement shoved it inside his waistcoat. Mr. Dwyer gave a nod of comprehension. Then, glancing at his two guardsmen, and finding that they were still interested in the wordy battle of the correspondence with their chief, and had seen nothing, he stooped and whispered to Gallagher, "'The forms are locked at twenty minutes to three. If you don't get there by that time, it will be of no use.' "'But if you're on time, you'll beat the town and the country, too.' Gallagher's eyes flashed significantly, and, nodding his head to show he understood, started boldly on a run toward the door. But the officers who guarded it brought him to an abrupt halt, and, much to Mr. Dwyer's astonishment, drew from him what was apparently a torrent of tears. "'Let me go to me father! I want me father!' the boy shrieked hysterically. "'They've arrested father! Oh, daddy, daddy! They're going to take you to prison!' "'Who is your father, Sonny?' asked one of the guardians of the gate. "'Kepler's me father!' sobbed Gallagher. "'They're going to lock him up, and I'll never see him no more!' "'Oh, yes, you will,' said the officer good-naturedly. "'He's there in that first patrol wagon. You can run over and say good-night to him, and then you'd better get to bed.' This ain't no place for kids of your age. Thank you, sir, sniffed Gallagher tearfully, as the two officers raised their clubs and let him pass out into the darkness. Part 3 The yard outside was in a tumult. Horses were stamping and plunging and backing the carriages into one another. 
lights were flashing from every window of what had been apparently an uninhabited house, and the voices of the prisoners were still raised in angry expostulation. Three police patrol wagons were moving about the yard, filled with unwilling passengers, who sat or stood, packed together like sheep, and with no protection from the sleet and rain. Gallagher stole off into a dark corner, and watched the scene until his eyesight became familiar with the position of the land. Then, with his eyes fixed fearfully on the swinging light of a lantern, with which an officer was searching among the carriages, he groped his way between horses' hoofs and behind the wheels of carriages to the cab, which he had himself placed at the furthermost gate. It was still there, and the horse, as he had left it, with its head turned toward the city. Gallagher opened the big gate noiselessly, and worked nervously at the hitching strap. The knot was covered with a thin coating of ice, and it was several minutes before he could loosen it. But his teeth finally pulled it apart, and with the reins in his hands he sprang upon the wheel. And as he stood so, a shock of fear ran down his back like an electric current, his breath left him, and he stood immovable, gazing with wide eyes into the darkness. The officer with the lantern had suddenly loomed up from behind a carriage not fifty feet distant, and was standing perfectly still, with his lantern held over his head, peering so directly toward Gallagher that the boy felt that he must see him. Gallagher stood with one foot on the hub of the wheel, and with the other on the box, waiting to spring. It seemed a minute before either of them moved, and then the officer took a step forward, and demanded sternly, "'Who is that? What are you doing there?' There was no time for parley then. Gallagher felt that he had been taken in the act, and that his only chance lay in open flight." He leaped up on the box, pulling out the whip as he did so, and with a quick sweep lashed the horse across the head and back. The animal sprang forward with a snort, narrowly clearing the gatepost, and plunged off into the darkness. "'Stop!' cried the officer. So many of Gallagher's acquaintances among the longshoremen and mill-hands had been challenged in so much the same manner that Gallagher knew what would probably follow if the challenge was disregarded. So he slipped from his seat to the footboard below and ducked his head. The three reports of a pistol, which rang out briskly from behind him, proved that his early training had given him a valuable fund of useful miscellaneous knowledge. "'Don't you be scared,' he said reassuringly to the horse. "'He's firing in the air.' The pistol shots were answered by the impatient clangor of a patrol wagon's gong, and glancing over his shoulder, Gallagher saw its red and green lanterns tossing from side to side, and looking in the darkness like the side lights of a yacht plunging forward in a storm. "'I hadn't bargained to race you against no patrol wagons.' said Gallagher to his animal. But if they want a race, we'll give them a tough tussle for it, won't we? Philadelphia, lying four miles to the south, sent up a faint yellow glow to the sky. It seemed very far away, and Gallagher's braggadocio grew cold within him at the loneliness of his adventure and the thought of the long ride before him. It was still bitterly cold." The rain and sleet beat through his clothes and struck his skin with a sharp chilling touch that set him trembling. Even the thought of the overweighted patrol wagon probably sticking in the mud some safe distance in the rear failed to cheer him, and the excitement that had so far made him callous to the cold died out and left him weaker and nervous. But his horse was chilled with the long standing, and now leaped eagerly forward, only too willing to warm the half-frozen blood in its veins. "'You're a good beast,' said Gallagher plaintively. "'You've got more nerve than me. Don't you go back on me now. Mr. Dwyer says we've got to beat the town.' Gallagher had no idea what time it was as he rode through the night, but he knew he would be able to find out from a big clock over a manufactory at a point nearly three-quarters of the distance from Kepler's to the goal. He was still in the open country and driving recklessly, for he knew the best part of his ride must be made outside the city limits. 
He raced between desolate-looking cornfields with bare stalks and patches of muddy earth rising above the thin covering of snow. Truck farms and brickyards fell behind him on either side. It was very lonely work, and once or twice the dogs ran yelping to the gates and barked after him. Part of his way lay parallel with the railroad tracks, and he drove for some time beside long lines of freight and coal cars as they stood resting for the night. The fantastic Queen Anne suburban stations were dark and deserted, but in one or two of the block towers he could see the operators writing at their desks, and the sight in some way comforted him. Once he thought of stopping to get out the blanket in which he had wrapped himself on the first trip, but he feared to spare the time, and drove on with his teeth chattering and his shoulders shaking with the cold. He welcomed the first solitary row of darkened houses with a faint cheer of recognition. The scattered lampposts lightened his spirits, and even the badly paved streets rang under the beats of his horse's feet like music. Great mills and manufactories, with only a night watchman's light in the lowest of their many stories, began to take the place of the gloomy farmhouses and gaunt trees that had startled him with their grotesque shapes. He had been driving nearly an hour, he calculated, and in that time the rain had changed to a wet snow that fell heavily and clung to whatever it touched. He passed block after block of trim workmen's houses, as still and silent as the sleepers within them, and at last he turned the horse's head into Broad Street, the city's great thoroughfare that stretches from its one end to the other and cuts it evenly in two. He was driving noiselessly over the snow and slush in the street, with his thoughts bent only on the clock face he wished so much to see, when a hoarse voice challenged him from the sidewalk. "'Hey, you, stop there! Hold up!' said the voice. Gallagher turned his head, and though he saw that the voice came from under a policeman's helmet, his only answer was to hit his horse sharply over the head with his whip, and to urge it into a gallop. This, on his part, was followed by a sharp, shrill whistle from the policeman. Another whistle answered it from a street corner one block ahead of him. "'Whoa!' said Gallagher, pulling on the reins. "'There's one too many of them,' he added, in apologetic explanation. The horse stopped and stood, breathing heavily, with great clouds of steam rising from its flanks. "'Why in hell didn't you stop when I told you to?' demanded the voice, now close at the cab's side. "'I didn't hear you,' replied Gallagher sweetly. "'But I heard you whistle, and I heard your partner whistle, and I thought maybe it was me you wanted to speak to, so I just stopped.' "'You heard me well enough. Why aren't your lights lit?' demanded the voice. "'Should I have them lit?' asked Gallagher, bending over and regarding them with sudden interest. "'You know you should, and if you don't, you've no right to be driving that cab. "'I don't believe you're the regular driver anyway. Where'd you get it?' "'It ain't my cab, of course,' said Gallagher, with an easy laugh. "'It's Luke McGovern's. He left it outside Cronin's while he went in to get a drink, "'and he took too much, and me father told me to drive it round to the stable for him. "'I'm Cronin's son. McGovern ain't in no condition to drive. "'You can see yourself how he's been misusing the horse.' He puts it up at Bachman's livery stable, and I was just going around there now. Gallagher's knowledge of the local celebrities of the district confused the zealous officer of the peace. He surveyed the boy with a steady stare that would have distressed a less skillful liar. But Gallagher only shrugged his shoulders slightly as if from the cold, and waited with apparent indifference to what the officer would say next. In reality, his heart was beating heavily against his side, and he felt that, if he was kept on a strain much longer, he would give way and break down. A second snow-covered form emerged suddenly from the shadow of the houses. "'What is it, reader?' it asked. "'Oh, nothing much,' replied the first officer. "'This kid hadn't any lamps lit, so I called to him to stop, and he didn't do it, so I whistled to you. It's all right, though. He's just taken it round to Bachman's.' "'Go ahead,' he added sulkily. "'Get up,' chirped Gallagher. "'Good night,' he added over his shoulder. 
Gallagher gave an hysterical little gasp of relief as he trotted away from the two policemen and poured bitter maledictions on their heads for two meddling fools as he went. "'They might as well kill a man as scare him to death,' he said, with an attempt to get back to his customary flippancy. But the effort was somewhat pitiful, and he felt guiltily conscious that a salt-warm tear was creeping slowly down his face and that a lump that would not keep down was rising in his throat. "'Tain't no fair thing for the whole police force to keep worrying at a little boy like me,' he said, in shamefaced apology. "'I'm not doing nothing wrong, and I'm half-froze to death, and yet they keep a nagging at me.' It was so cold that when the boy stamped his feet against the footboard to keep them warm, sharp pains shot up through his body, and when he beat his arms about his shoulders— as he had seen real cabmen do, the blood in his fingertips tingled so acutely that he cried aloud with the pain. He had often been up that late before, but he had never felt so sleepy. It was as if someone was pressing a sponge heavy with chloroform near his face, and he could not fight off the drowsiness that lay hold of him. He saw, dimly hanging above his head, a round disk of light that seemed like a great moon, and which he finally guessed to be the clock face for which he had been on the lookout. He had passed it before he realized this, but the fact stirred him into wakefulness again, and when his cab's wheels slipped around the city hall corner, he remembered to look up at the other big clock face that keeps awake over the railroad station and measures out the night. He gave a gasp of consternation when he saw that it was half-past two and that there was but ten minutes left to him. This, and the many electric lights and the sight of the familiar pile of buildings, startled him into a semi-consciousness of where he was and how great was the necessity for haste. He rose in his seat and called on the horse and urged it into a reckless gallop over the slippery asphalt. He considered nothing else but speed, and looking neither to the left nor right, dashed off down Broad Street into Chestnut, where his course lay straight away to the office, now only seven blocks distant. Gallagher never knew how it began, but he was suddenly assaulted by shouts on either side. His horse was thrown back on its haunches, and he found two men in cabman's livery hanging at its head, and patting its sides and calling it by name. And the other cabmen, who have their stand at the corner, were swarming about the carriage, all of them talking and swearing at once, and gesticulating wildly with their whips. They said they knew the cab was McGovern's, and they wanted to know where he was, and why he wasn't on it. They wanted to know where Gallagher had stolen it, and why he had been such a fool as to drive it into the arms of its owner's friends. They said that it was about time that a cab driver could get off his box to take a drink without having his cab run away with, and some of them called loudly for a policeman to take the young thief in charge. Gallagher felt as if he had been suddenly dragged into consciousness out of a bad dream, and stood for a second like a half-awakened somnambulist. They had stopped the cab under an electric light, and its glare shone coldly down upon the trampled snow and the faces of the men around him. Gallagher bent forward and lashed savagely at the horse with his whip. "'Let me go!' he shouted, as he tugged impotently at the reins. "'Let me go, I tell you. I haven't stole no cab, and you've got no right to stop me. "'I only want to take it to the press office,' he begged. "'They'll send it back to you all right. They'll pay you for the trip. "'I'm not running away with it. The driver's got the collar. He's rested. "'And I'm only a-going to the press office. Do you hear me?' he cried, his voice rising and breaking in a shriek of passion and disappointment. "'I tell you to let go of those reins. Let me go or I'll kill you. Do you hear me? I'll kill you!' And leaning forward, the boy struck savagely with his long whip at the faces of the men about the horse's head. Someone in the crowd reached up and caught him by the ankles, and with a quick jerk pulled him off the box and threw him on to the street." but he was up on his knees in a moment and caught at the man's hand. "'Don't let them stop me, mister,' he cried. "'Please let me go. I didn't steal the cab, sir. So help me I didn't. I'm telling you the truth. Take me to the press office and they'll prove it to you. They'll pay you anything you ask them.' 
"'It's only such a little ways now, and I've come so far, sir. "'Please don't let them stop me,' he sobbed, clasping the man about the knees. "'For heaven's sake, mister, let me go!' The managing editor of the press took up the India rubber speaking tube at his side and answered, Not yet, to an inquiry the night editor had already put to him five times within the last twenty minutes. Then he snapped the metal top of the tube impatiently and went upstairs. As he passed the door of the local room, he noticed that the reporters had not gone home, but were sitting about on the tables and chairs, waiting. They looked up inquiringly as he passed, and the city editor asked, "'Any news yet?' and the managing editor shook his head. The compositors were standing idle in the composing room, and their foreman was talking with the night editor. "'Well?' said that gentleman tentatively. "'Well,' returned the managing editor, "'I don't think we can wait. Do you?' "'It's a half-hour after time now.' said the night editor, and we'll miss the suburban trains if we hold the paper back any longer. We can't afford to wait for a purely hypothetical story. The chances are all against the fights having been taken place, or this Hades having been arrested. But if we're beaten on it, suggested the chief, but I don't think that is possible. If there were any story to print, Dwyer would have had it here before now. The managing editor looked steadily down at the floor. "'Very well,' he said slowly. "'We won't wait any longer. "'Go ahead,' he added, turning to the foreman with a sigh of reluctance. "'The foreman whirled himself about and began to give his orders, "'but the two editors still looked at each other doubtfully. "'As they stood so, there came a sudden shout "'and the sound of people running to and fro in the repertorial rooms below.' There was the tramp of many footsteps on the stairs, and above the confusion they heard the voice of the city editor telling someone to run to Madden's and get some brandy, quick. No one in the composing room said anything, but those compositors who had started to go home began slipping off their overcoats, and everyone stood with his eyes fixed on the door. It was kicked open from the outside, and in the doorway stood a cab driver and the city editor, supporting between them a pitiful little figure of a boy, wet and miserable, and with the snow melting on his clothes and running in little pools to the floor. "'Why, it's Gallagher,' said the night editor, in a tone of the keenest disappointment. Gallagher shook himself free from his supporters and took an unsteady step forward, his fingers fumbling stiffly with the buttons of his waistcoat. "'Mr. Dwyer, sir,' he began faintly, with his eyes fixed fearfully on the managing editor. "'He got arrested, and I couldn't get here no sooner, cause they kept a stop in me, and they took me cab from under me. But—' He pulled the notebook from his breast and held it out with its covers damp and limp from the rain. But we got Hade, and here's Mr. Dwyer's copy. And then he asked, with a queer note in his voice, partly of dread and partly of hope, Am I in time, sir? The managing editor took the book and tossed it to the foreman, who ripped out its leaves and dealt them out to his men as rapidly as a gambler deals out cards. Then the managing editor stooped and picked Gallagher up in his arms, and sitting down, began to unlace his wet and muddy shoes. Gallagher made a faint effort to resist this degradation of the managerial dignity, but his protest was a very feeble one, and his head fell back heavily on the managing editor's shoulder. To Gallagher, the incandescent lights began to whirl about in circles and to burn in different colors, the faces of the reporters kneeling before him and chafing his hands and feet grew dim and unfamiliar. And the roar and rumble of the great presses in the basement sounded far away, like the murmur of the sea. And then the place and the circumstances of it came back to him again sharply and with sudden vividness. Gallagher looked up, with a faint smile, into the managing editor's face. "'You won't turn me off for running away, will you?' he whispered. The managing editor did not answer immediately. His head was bent, and he was thinking, for some reason or other, of a little boy of his own at home in bed. Then he said quietly, "'Not this time, Gallagher.' Gallagher's head sank back comfortably on the older man's shoulder, and he smiled comprehensively at the faces of the young men crowded around him. 
"'You hadn't ought to,' he said, with a touch of his old impudence. "'Cause I beat the town.'" End of Section 3